Ambassador Seto is currently the Kiribati Ambassador to the United Nations and the United States and the Ambassador Designate to Canada and Mexico. In essence, all of North America. There aren't that many ambassadors who are all of North America. Prior to his appointment in the diplomatic service, Ambassador Seto had represented and served his communities, his people, his electorate for 30 years in government from 1987 to 2017. During that time, he had many roles. He was president of the Republic from 1994 to 2003. He was also a member of parliament and he was a member of the opposition. During his tenure as president, he arranged for Kiribati's membership in the United Nations and he attended the Millennium Summit of the year 2000. He was also deeply involved in promulgating the Millennium Development Goals. Now, I know, Mr. Ambassador, that you've told me many fascinating details about Kiribati, um, but today we have thousands of listeners online who are teachers, who are students, who are business people. And like me, none of them have been to Kiribati, or at least very, very, very few have. And a few of them probably have seen pictures of it, but I'm not sure that they know much about it. So I'd ask you to tell us more about Kiribati and about the policies that you implemented. Please, Mr. Ambassador. Well, thank you, Adam, for the question as to where is Kiribati? How do you find Kiribati? Let me assure you that's not very difficult to find Kiribati because once you are in Hawaii, Honolulu, you can catch a, a two-hour flight to Christmas Island, which is the, very near to Honolulu. That's one of our most nearest islands to the state of Hawaii. And so, but the islands, of course, are made up, the nation is made up of 33 islands in the Central Pacific, with its uh, western boundary, you know, far away, about 4,000 miles away from Christmas to the west is uh, Tarawa, an, an, an ocean island, ocean island even further west, near to Nauru. Nauru is another nation. So the, it's made up, the nation is made up of 33 islands spread along the equator, east west, and uh, covering, of course, a, a, a huge ocean. Uh, but the land masses are quite small. Uh, if you add up all the 33 islands, they total up to 810 square kilometer, but they're really spread and scattered in three major main groups. The Western group is called the archipelago, so we say. The Western archipelago is uh, made up of 16 islands, and that is called the Gilbert Islands Archipelago, the Gilbert Islands group. And of course, uh, it's named Gilbert because of the Captain Gilberts who brought the first settlers to Australia in, 18, in 1788, right? That's a long time back, of course, much after the US was settled. And, um, and so the Captain Gilberts and the Captain Marshalls were the, 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 the captains who brought the first settlers in Australia. And on their way back, they, you know, they have to sail with the wind and tag north. And they eventually they sighted these islands across the horizon. The first lot of island was called Gilbert Islands. And the next lot further north is called the Marshall Islands, named after these two great captains. Gilbert Islands is interesting. We call it Kiribati, Gilbert. Kilbert is really, you know, gives us the word Kiribati, you know, they, they, they sound similar. But so there it is, that's the origin. We were there, but they found us. As they always say, they always say, found us and they put us on the map, thank God. We were on the map from that time. And so, but we have that, that archipelago in the West, which is called the Gilbert Archipelago. And then in the further East, in the center, it's called the Phoenix Archipelago, Phoenix Islands. And there are eight islands there. And then further east, nearer to Hawaii, is the 
Line Island Archipelago. Again, made up of eight islands spread apart. Christmas Island is, is of course, the, the, the sub-capital of the uh, Line Islands group. And as I said, about two hours from Honolulu. And uh, Christmas Island, interestingly, is the biggest coral atoll in the world. If you look for an atoll bigger than Christmas, you won't find it. It's not easy to build an atoll, they say. But they are, the Christmas Island managed to uh, go that big. And it, in fact, it takes up half of the area of Kiribati. It made up half of the area of the 810 square kilometer, more than half, is in the Christmas Island. And so, of course, it's a great, uh, a big country for a big island for us. And we might go there and hide if the, 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 the uh, climate change uh, continues to threaten us. Uh, and we may, may have to raise the island. Because the islands are really very low. They are atolls, coral atolls or islands, as they say. And uh, the highest point would be about two meters. And to you know, hide away from the climate change is not easy, because it's, it's, it's quite a challenge. Because as you move back, you fall on the other side. It's, it's the sea. It's, it's a, you cannot uh, retreat back to the hills. There are no hills. It's all flat, sandy. Coconut trees, and not much vegetation because the, uh, the coral sand does not support much uh, vegetation. But the, of course, luckily, the vegetation we have is enough for survival, and we are able to get everything we need. And, you know, anything food wise, and medicine wise, and nutrition wise, we get it all from there, but mostly from the sea because we are made up of 99.98% ocean and 0.002 to something, uh, land, but much of our needs come from the sea. I would say 90% of our survival needs, food-wise and everything. We call the sea our cupboard, our fridge. We simply go out and collect, it's all there. Children, women, you don't have to be a courageous guy to go out of the sea because the sea flat is always there ready at low tide to walk and you can collect whatever you want. Uh, lobsters, crabs, you know, you name them. Lobs, you know, eels, octopus, you name anything in the sea in the, in the world, it's all there. Anyway, the islands are made up, of course, of, uh, of people. Uh, the people there are just, we may say, they're all of one uh, uh, race. We call them the, the Kiribati, Tungaru. The old name of Kiribati was Tungaru. But when Captain Gilbert came, we forgot about the word Tungaru. We're now using Kiribati, which comes from Gilbats. And so we are lucky. We are free from the racial uh, divides and, you know, the ethnic divides. We are homogeneous society. One language, one set of custom, one set of understanding. We don't have, you know, language problem. We don't have misunderstanding. Of course, there are always, uh, you know, what you call dialectical differences, but it, it doesn't affect us. And the people, of course, are mainly Christians. You know, 90% of the population is Christian. The rest is not. And, uh, and they, uh, let me also say that the, uh, uh, the, we are generally peaceful uh, people, peaceful in terms of, because we don't have much conflict. We don't have boundary conflict. We may have small ones. Landowners claim over land, you know, dispute over land boundary, but these are small little uh, conflicts that happen. We don't have major conflict that you have in the bigger countries. So it's generally free, relaxed, open. You know, everybody knows everybody. You know, and then so we are generally free from the pressures that uh, the big countries have. So that is on Kiribati. Now, I'd like also just to say something here as a general statement about. Uh, my being here, and I'm very happy to be part of this occasion, and I'm really certainly honored uh, to be part of this occasion to address uh, fellow geographer, geography lovers on this very special occasion. And I wish to thank the president of the American Geographic Society for this rare and honor, this rare honor to be part of the Geography 2050, and for the opportunity to share some geographical features about Gibbs, as I've already done and our good and long-time neighbors and friends, the people of the, I'd like to share this with our good and, and long-time neighbors and friends, the people of the United States. I would like to focus in my remarks on the bounty of the ocean preserving the, our blue planet, but I will do that later when I address the teachers. 
at the outset, let me admit that geography had always been one of my most favorite subjects in school from the very first day. I ended classroom learning about 60 years ago. And, uh, and right up to senior secondary education, when I suddenly found out that I could not continue with it after my teachers decided to put me in a science stream in which only science students were taught. But that did not affect my deep personal taste for geography. So I continued reading geography books and materials that I could lay my hands on in school and outside school. And I've continued doing that up to now. So I'm very, very grateful for this opportunity. And I know that geography remains uh, to be a very important part of our school curriculum in Kilbert. I've enjoyed geography and I've learned a great deal from it. The spirit of geography, you know, the discovery spirit, wanting to get out and know more, has done great uh, work for me. And I've uh, been able to, to succeed as, as a man representing Kilbert outside by having these uh, urge to connect, to, to know more, to connect with other people, with other cultures, with other races. And I'm very lucky that here, as an ambassador of Kiribati, the United Nations, and the United and Washington, and, and very soon to Canada, and um, and 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 Mexico, the, the 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 spirit of geography is well and alive in me, which enables me to reach out without too much difficulty, because I do know there are so many beautiful people, beautiful. Uh, ideas out there to interact with, which will benefit me and my country as I represent my country this time. And so I'm very, I'm very, uh, I'm very fortunate that I'm here in the United, United Nations connecting with other ambassadors. I have no problem reaching out to them. Why? Because of the, the spirit of geography that has been instilled with me from the very start of my schooling. In, in primary and then up to secondary, as I mentioned earlier. And uh, now, of course, I would like to take this opportunity to pay tribute to the American Geographic Society for its great service to humanity through its long continuing work for the past 169 years since its inception in 1851. Interestingly, 1851 was the year the first American missionaries set out from San Francisco to bring the good news to the islands and people of Micronesia in, in the North and Central Pacific, which included the Gilbert Islands, Kiribati, now called Kiribati, which was eventually six years after the missionaries set out from San Francisco. So in 1857, yeah, the, the American missionaries arrived in one of my islands and they start preaching about, you know, the the good news. Good news, you know, the world is big, you know, you know everybody's out there, all loved and all uh, cared for by one one super creator out there. And so, so we're replacing what we had then, because we believe in ancestral gods. Ancestral gods were there to look after us. But when the Christian gospel came, as brought by the American missionaries from Boston, Yes, we adopted a global view that and here we are, and here I am, being part of you. And all this happened because, maybe because of the geographic society, uh, you know, sort of briefing those who were going out to the islands. Because by then, I think th there had already been uh, an, an expedition by the American uh, scientists going out to the islands. They already mapped the islands. And so that was a useful piece of geography for the missionaries that some mapping had already been done by the American expedition, as they call it, 18, I think it was 1850, uh, yeah, 50, a few years after the, uh, the American Geographic Society, 1853 or 54, that the, uh, the American expedition of the islands took place. And so I'd like to thank you again, thank the American uh, Geographic Society for this honor and privilege of being part of this occasion, and especially for elevating the, uh, uh, the profile of Kilbes in this uh, event by making Kilbes a focus of your geogra geography, geography 2050 event. I thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. That was a lovely introduction and it was a fascinating historical link that you made. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Randy Rojan. She is an assistant professor at Boston University in the biology department and also in BU's marine program. She received her BS from Cornell University and her PhD from Tufts University. She spent eight years as a research scientist at the New England Aquarium. And currently, besides being a professor at BU, she is the co-chief scientist of the Phoenix Island Protected Areas, which you just heard a little bit about, where she leads the science program for what is the world's largest and deepest UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, on a personal level, Dr. Rojan is a member of the Women Working for Overseas, for Oceans, and the Explorers Club. Dr. Rojan, can you tell us a little bit about PIPA? Thank you, Adam. I would love to. Um, and let me first say a big thank you to the American Geographical Society for hosting this incredible event. I can think of no more precious time than to think about our oceans now and what they will look like in 2050. And I can't think of any people but that I'd rather um, have this conversation with than you, Adam, and the Honorable Ambassador Sito, who has been a dear friend and a wonderful collaborator and colleague. And it is an incredible um, honor, pleasure, and um, it's just so much fun to be here with you. And I'm really glad <laughs> that we get to do this together. So. Um, I never know if I can do PIPA justice. It is such an incredible place, but I will try in just a few slides to, um, to show you some of what the Phoenix Islands or protected area or PIPA looks like and share with you some of the vignettes of some of the exciting science that's happening. I am here to talk to you a little bit about the Phoenix Islands protected area. And before I even begin, let me say that the work that I'm showing you right now is the work of many, many people. Um, and it's a story that's 20 years old this year. The Phoenix Islands were first um, sort of scientifically discovered in the year 2000 with Greg Stone and David Obura and Sangeeta Mangubai. And then since then, we have um, become a marine protected area in 2006, um, fully implemented in 2008, inscribed as a World Heritage Site in 2009. And here we are in 2020, 20 years later, sharing the exciting science and the beauty and some of these remarkable creatures that live in this incredibly remote place. So let me take you there. Starting in a part, you know, these iconic now, you know, views from space, which are so special of our earth. Um, it's always easy to start in a place that's familiar. And I know what you're thinking. You know, I've looked at a million images of the globe <laughs> um, from space, you know, it's all familiar. And that's sort of true until we spin it and really start to get a sense of how big the Pacific is, which at least for me, um, even my whole entire life, you know, of course, looking at these incredible images, you know, when I sit still and think and really contemplate the scale of the Pacific, it still takes my breath away. And the Phoenix Islands protected area sits in a very special spot in the Pacific, right here, this little box, um, I use little in a, an interesting way because it is little um, compared to the scale of the Pacific, but it is big too. It's roughly the size of California for a sense of scale. It's um, about 408,000 square kilometers and it sits just below the equator in the equatorial Pacific and is a very interesting place oceanographically. This place is part of the Republic of Kiribati, which actually has three island archipelagos. The Phoenix Islands protected area is in the Phoenix Island arch archipelago, which is in the central, the center of the three archipelagos. And these three archipelagos are, um, they have 33 islands total across them. And if you were to smush them together, uh, J. Martin Troost says that, uh, I, love, I love his analogy. He says, you know, you'd roughly have this, a land mass the size of Baltimore. But if you spread them apart, right, and you look at them in their full scale, they spread the continental distance of, you know, the, the, the distance of Australia or across the, United, the continental United States. So this is a very large ocean area. And this places Kiribati as one of the largest ocean countries in the world. The Phoenix Islands protected area was one of the original large scale marine protected areas. First, there was Australia's Great Barrier, uh, Great Barrier Reef Marine Park in the late 70s. Um, and then uh, the Phoenix Islands protected area and Papahanaumokuakea in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands came um, to be roughly the same period of time. And since then, there have been a number of large scale marine protected areas uh, that have 
uh, cropped up throughout the world and a lot in the Pacific, including the United States Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monuments, which, you know, as an American for me, makes me always think of the Phoenix Islands and Kiribati as being the country right next door, even though it's several thousand miles away from where I live. So marine protected areas are one of the best ways that we have, not the only way, but one of the best ways that we have to protect the ocean. And in recognition of that, marine protected areas or MPAs are growing in number and size. This is an image I took from the Marine um, MPA Atlas just this morning. It was last updated just a few days ago. So this is the most current snapshot there is. And what I wanna to point to you is all of these colorful squares, dots, circles, and otherwise interesting shapes spread throughout the globe are all places that are either currently protected are partially protected, are implemented, or sorry, designed and hopefully implemented for protection in the future, or are proposed and committed. And despite all of this, you know, this beautiful colored rainbow of protection, uh, we have very little of the ocean protected overall. Um, certainly have not yet approached 10% uh, or 20%, which I think a lot of people are hoping for um, in the near in, in the coming decades, which of course is part of Geography 2050. But the Phoenix Islands, I hope you can see my mouse, is, is here, right here in the center, this square box. And it's special for a number of reasons. First, when you think about its fishing protection, protection level, it's fully protected. Second, it's fully established, designed, and implemented. And third, it's one of the very few among the very large size class. So right here, this last little piece. And that makes the Phoenix Islands um, not only the largest and deepest UNESCO World Heritage Site, not only the first large scale marine protected area put forth by a least developed country, but also remaining today as one of the most important marine protected areas in terms of how large it is, how well it's protected and what it's protecting. This is a, a, a bit of a, another rainbow graph for you, but I really like it. It shows um, what was the fishing effort, the number of fishing days on the left side of this graph before PIPA was closed for fishing protection. And you can see that before and after the number of fishing days was were dramatically reduced, showing that this was an area where there was a lot of fishing and extractive activity, a place that really could benefit from, from protection. And once protected, um, the fishing effort was dramatically reduced. A paper was just published this year looking at a bunch of large scale marine protected areas one year before and one year after closure. And I want to draw your attention to the Phoenix Islands protected area here, which shows this dramatic change or difference in fishing effort a year before and a year after closure. A lot of other large scale marine protected areas, very importantly, were able to lock in the protections uh, prior to exploitation, but the Phoenix Islands were able to not just lock in their protections, but they were able to protect an area that was actively being utilized. And so the Phoenix Islands offer a very special place in marine protected as here area history, their current importance, as well, of course, their geographic fascination for where they are. When I say fishing protection, what we're mostly talking about, of course, are tuna, which are a very important food resource and a very important global economic resource and a very important economic resource for the Republic of Kiribati. And now that they're no longer being fished regularly, um, one of the ways we study this incredibly beautiful wild animal is to look at their um, larval forms. So in case you've never seen a picture of a larval tuna, I wanted to, I couldn't leave you today without making sure you've seen a picture of one. Um, and some of those science that we're doing is taking some untraditional, unconventional approach, approaches to trying to study and ask questions about whether or not PIPA is a spawning ground for tuna, they are, and whether or not we see changes in tuna demographics. And you'll have to stay tuned on that because that's a longer scale question that we have to answer over many, many years and over time. But the way we do this now is we go out to the, um, to PIPA, which is really far away, right? It's, um, I think I showed you on a map where it, where it is, but to put this in context, when you're out there, the closest permanent population to you are on the International Space Station. And so we go out for weeks at a time with a bunch of colleagues and collaborators. This, these particular data were taken from the Sea Education Association, throwing nets over the side, capturing the zooplankton, tons of undergraduates then sort through the incredible you know, soup that is the surface of the ocean, the upper 50 meters, in order to pull out the larval tuna and their eggs in order to look at where, whether and where they are spawning within PIPA, which is a very important question and one that remains of economic importance to the protected area, the country, and of course the Pacific as a whole. Back to the protected area. It's called the Phoenix Islands Protected Area, which is really a misnomer. There's eight islands, they're beautiful, 
They were actually uh, embarked upon uh, by Darwin way back when. It was part of the way he started to think about atolls, which of course, there's new information coming to light about the you know atoll formation, but this sort of was one of the places that helped Darwin to think about how atolls might have been formed. But when we think about the Phoenix Islands, I know we're thinking about um, the islands because of the name, but and I'll show you some of those. But I also wanted to show you just how close you are to the deep sea and to the open ocean. So this is Canton Island, the only inhabited island in the Phoenix Islands protected area. And when I say inhabited, I mean a caretaker population, um, government employees, about 25 to 50 people total, who use this island as a home base to live, to protect, to um, enforce the protections of the protected area. The rest of the islands have nobody living on them. For example, Rowake, this is the whole island. You can walk around it in about a half an hour. It's an important bird nesting site. You can see the reef surrounding it. And then of course you can see the deep blue of the open ocean and then the deep sea, right, with a, literally a stone's throw away from anywhere you're standing. Some of the reefs don't even break the surface. They are seamounts that just some come so close, but no longer have any surficial evidence, um, you can't see them at all. And then some places like this, Nikomororo, are almost just as large as Canton, but have no people at all. And so to give you a sense of this place, I just wanted to show you these aerial views to show you how much ocean there is and how small the islands really are. So keeping that in mind, I love this cartoon, you know, this 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 person contemplating the sea, I hope, or <laughs> contemplating whatever it is that they're thinking about, who doesn't realize that they're what they're sitting on is an incredible treasure of um, of marine life as well as human history right below them. Trying to make a map in a place that's so remote and so far away is a hard thing to do. Um, but this is the best map we have. This was made by Sarah Rosenthal from the University of Hawaii, um, and she worked to put all of our a multi-beam sonar, multi-beam echo sounder data together, um, intertwined with the satellite altimetry to come up with the most bathymetrically accurate map that we have, showcasing what's really in the Phoenix Islands, which as you can see is so much more than just the islands themselves. The islands are marked, um, you can see them named in white, but of course there's an underwater mountain chain, there's clusters of islands. In the very center, you'll see this dark area, which is actually a hadal trough, tons of abyssal plain, and of course, all of this has a whole lot of ocean sitting on top of it. Just to give you a sense of perspective, the average depth of the abyssal plain in this area is roughly five to 6,000 meters below the surface of the sea. So this is a whole lot of ocean volume. This is just the satellite altimetry data, but can give you a better sense maybe of, um, of uh, what this might look like um, from this angle. And again, you can see all of these different ocean features. So the Phoenix Islands are not just the islands themselves. They also have coral reefs, pelagic open ocean, the deep sea, of course, what we see on the surface of the islands. But putting them together is one of the most important things that we're trying to do. Understand how this place functions in the central Pacific with no people around. So just a few quick little stories, um, which are very relevant to our global situation. Of course, everywhere it's very depressing. Uh, there's a global decline of tropical coral reefs. And everywhere you go in the world, we can see evidence that reefs were are no longer what they once were, even just a few decades ago. But there are places that still thrive, and there are places that have high resilience, and there are places that are recovering. And the Phoenix Islands are part of that story. You know, it's a really important question in the place in the middle of nowhere to ask, if you leave the reefs alone, can they recover? And the reefs in, I'm just going to show you one small spot, the Canton Lagoon prior to bleaching um, uh, was very delicately layered. It was um, clearly a very mature coral community um, and it had been undisturbed for a long period of time. Then in 2000 and 2002, the Phoenix Islands bleached uh, devastatingly. So there was almost 100% mortality in this area. But a short decade later, the reefs had rebounded. And this gives us great hope. Um, and also, it's very interesting for us to try to understand the mechanisms of recovery, the mechanisms of resilience and of repopulation, and of trying to understand why certain reefs do recover like this, and while some reefs still don't. And in order to do that, you know, these long-term studies go across multiple and so states, looking at El Nino, La Nina, and so neutral years, and trying to understand how reefs change. But trying to do this in a place where we don't live and where we don't have access to is very hard. 
And so we've been using some technology developed by Stuart Sandin and his group out at San Diego and Scripps um, as part of the 100 Islands Challenge using photogrammetry or e-reefs where we can look underwater, um, make a map uh, essentially stitching together thousands of photographs with uh, several hours of scuba diving and then being able to look closely at these high definition benthic uh, photo mosaics over time for years later sometimes in order to get a sense of what we have. Here's an example from Christmas Island also owned by Kiribati, and it really shows you how we can look at the change in coral demographics and benthic communities from year to year. And this kind of technology is really important in a place where you can't go back and just say, ah, I forgot to measure something. Let's go back and look again. We can only look again through our photographs. And so the quality of the photographs and the quality of the technology is critical to enable us to study benthic change. It's not just the imagery, there's data involved, um, and there's a lot of data embedded in this imagery. Um, what I'm showing you here is the work of hundreds of undergraduate, hundreds of hours of undergraduate time, you know, tracing individual corals and then identifying them to species so that we can click each species on and off and ask ourselves questions about whether or not some species are growing faster than others, or whether some are grow when, better when they're closer to others or whether there are some inhibitory properties. And these kinds of e-reefs and e-reef technology, photo mosaic technology, is helpful for us to understand not just whether or not the Phoenix Islands as a whole are resilient, but how each place comes back or doesn't. And each site is different. And this place-based ecology relies on cutting edge technology to help enable us to learn. The Phoenix Islands, this is just four different years of recently. This is 2015, 16, 17, and 18. It just shows you some, some of the differences in sea surface temperature that these islands can experience. And so this is not a straightforward study where we measure it once and we know what's going to happen for the future. If we're gonna think about geography 2050, we have to understand how things change dynamically through time. And so finally, just to wrap up, I'll give you one more vignette. Here's our, 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 our island resident thinking, um, you know, we're sitting on top of this incredibly large seamount. And one of the other things that we have to do for him and for us is to um, really give, give uh, a picture, a better visual, a better map, and a better map um, of not just uh, what could be there, but what's actually there with visuals too. And the way we do this is really through partnership. Um, we've had several ships go out to the deep sea of the Phoenix Islands in the past few years, just since 2017. We've done a little bit more than 25 ROV dives and mapped about 21.1% of the marine protected area with multi-beam sonar using these large government ships or foundation ships and large um, remotely operated vehicles, large ROVs to go down and look at this ocean part of the PIP of the Phoenix Islands. And uh, before you can take a large scale ROV down, you have to make a map, right? This map is insufficient to dive on. So we take, um, we make these multi-beam echo sound Echo sounder maps, these rainbow colored sections to give us much more detail. And these are very important because if you were to take a look at the this image, for example, this top gray blob is the satellite altimetry map. The bottom shows the multi-beam sonar. And if you were to overlay them, um, just for example, in this peak over here at the very top, there's a 950 meter difference. And so you can't drive um, essentially an FTV sized robot on a map that's 950 meters off and inaccurate. So we make better maps. They look like this. Uh, spend some time deciding where we're going to dive and then um, make a drive track. This is a roughly an eight to 10 hour track. We say, okay, let's go hike this, hike this trail, right? Hike the, uh, take the ROV on this particular space on the map. And we do this, um, it's dark down there. So only with the lights we bring with us. So these ROVs have high definition cameras and um, a lot of light that they can use to light up an area. And from this small, sorry, just to just to drive this home. This you know is a tiny space explored. There's still a lot more to explore, but just in these tiny spaces that we can go, we see incredible things, beautiful, colorful deep sea corals. Some of which have been alive for well over a thousand years. We see a diversity of taxa, some new species which have never been discovered, new species of coral, of sponge, of crab, of brittle star of snails, lots of new things, new species of bacteria, 
even, which have implications for trying to understand um, the way the microbial life interacts with the macro um, fauna down in the deep sea and may have implications for us biomedically here on the surface. And what we don't know is amazing. Uh, you know, we always, people are always asking us what we do know about the deep sea and we do know a lot, but what we don't know is just as incredible, even at the species level. Um, uh, which, or sorry, especially at the species level, the 80% of what we see, we don't, we ha has not yet been described. And even at the family level, we range between, you know, 10 and 40% of the taxonomic families have yet to be described in these areas. And so I will, um, and so I will just show you a couple of images of what this looks like. Um, from the deep sea, you can see this incredible imagery with these high definition cameras, these corals. This is this is live, um, not live, but this is uh, live captured footage from when we were down in the deep sea, lit up um, and illuminated. You can see these incredible colors and creatures which have literally never been seen before. And trying to discover what the Phoenix Islands is really protecting has been part of our challenge. And then trying to study these animals and understand what we can learn from them. Um, it requires a lot of technology, a lot of patience, and it's 100% worth doing. We do this in collaboration with the Republic of Kiribati. We do this because going someplace new is incredible. Going someplace remote is the only play, way, way we can really study nature without too much anthropogenic influence. And we do this in partnership and collaboration with a country which has protected this incredibly large part of the ocean, but doesn't have the capacity to access it. I don't have the capacity to access it without partnership, collaboration, and a lot of people who might be watching this who always can help to contribute. So I'll leave you with my favorite view of the Pacific. And again, I'm excited to have this conversation with Adam and the ambassador to talk about this view and what this place means in the context of our entire globe. And um, to really think about how much one protected area has been able to contribute and how many more protected areas are also helping to contribute to protecting our global oceans. Thank you. Thank you so much, Randy. That was really interesting. I'd like to start our discussion section now by asking you a question and it will flow into a question for Ambassador Sito, which is that how do you set up the governance structures and how do you set up policies of use and where do you want to see this go over time for what is an ocean structure? We as Americans are used to governance structures for terrestrial subjects, but you are dealing with the deep ocean and the ocean where people aren't living as you've shown. And you, uh, Mr. Former President, uh, and now, Mr. Ambassador, you were governing a country that is 99.98% ocean and only two one thousandths land mass, as Randy has already pointed out. This must change the way you want to govern and what policies you set. And I'd also love to hear where you'd like to see this go over the next 30 years because we are at Geography 2050. Randy, over to you, and please then lead in, Mr. Ambassador. Absolutely, it's a really important question, and I'm very grateful that I don't have to be the one governing, <laughs> um, because it is a really challenging question to answer. And I think it's one that, it's not just Kiribati um, who's trying to answer this, right? It's a uh, large, large ocean, um, sorry, small island developing states and or large ocean, states, as you might want to think of them, are all dealing with um, these kinds of issues everywhere. I will say from the science point of view that one of the things that I'm most proud of and I think is really special and important and I'd like to see amplified in the next 30 years is um, the way we interface science with policy and making sure that there is truly transparent conversation and communication. And I'm really, really proud of the work that my Curibus collaborators and I have been able to do in order to start that process for the Phoenix Islands protected area. For example, we have the Science Advisory Committee, which does review all of the permits um, to make sure that the latest science can be brought to bear on any of the potential activities that may happen in PIPA. We speak um, directly to the PIPA Conservation Trust, which of course has several government ministers, as well as the ambassador as chair, um, as well as our 
our external um, partners and collaborators and funders to make sure that the science is delivered everywhere. And then we really go to Tarawa, which is the capital, and speak to the people, speak to students, speak to the government, speak to um, villages in Minneapolis, um, and make sure that science is accessible to anybody who would like to access it. And it's something that I think um, needs to grow and needs to continue to um, to continue to grow and find support and find new voices and find new avenues to participate. But I do think that this back and forth between science and policy is not just set on paper in this protected area. It's very real, it's very tangible. And the relation and it's all built on the backs of very strong relationships. And I, I think that's very special. Ambassador, I'm sure you'd like to say more about the actual governance and about your role as the chair of the Phoenix Islands Protected Area Conservation Trust. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Rochin, and thank you, Adam, for putting the question to, uh, of course, to Randy and myself. And it's a very important question. How do we uh, move forward with what we have? And uh, of course, I thank uh, uh, Randy for, you know, for the details and the articulation of uh, what we have. You know, uh, every person in Kiribati uh, now knows more and more that the, you know, the ocean is so important. And, uh, and of course, if I can just sort of flash back to the days when I was a little boy and uh, I would always hear my parents say, you can never go hungry. You know, there's so much food out there. There's the cupboard, there's the, you know, no fridge in those days, but there's the cupboard, there's the cupboard of food. They just go out and get it. That is a famous saying to kids when they come back from school and they come hungry and they kind of look at the the, the food the cupboard and there's nothing there and they say, no, come on, get yourself out, just go out there and dig something in the sand and you know you, you'll find food in the in the sea. I I hope that we will still say that 50, 20, 2050 geography 2050 will report that that's what we're still saying in the islands, in Kiribati. And why I'm asking that question and why I'm posing it, because there is a threat now, as, uh, as uh, indicated by uh, Randy. You know, uh, you know the, it's, it's, what is it? Globalization, modernization, whatever you call it, it's sweeping the earth, even sweeping those of us in the islands. And we know that we cannot damage uh, do enough damage because we're a small population the ocean is so big but we are not the ones doing that you know there are forces from outside coming in in the name of economic development in the name of economic prosperity uh, you know we've got to go out and 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 and, and, and gather and, and 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 turn it around into economic wealth and and there is no limit to economic wealth there is limit to storing food in the cupboard Sorting fish, octopus, you know, they, you, you can only, only collect enough for the day or a, or a few days. But in the name of economic, you can, you know, just keep on mopping up whatever you see and keep accumulating it because there's no end to it. And this is the danger, as I see it in the island. And so now we are part of this global uh, fight against these forces or at least moderating them, at least making them more sensible and rational. Because what we're doing is just destroying ourselves in the name of what? Prosperity? Progress? No, I think we're, we're losing sight of the, re, the most important uh, reason why we are on the planet. We are humans, we want to continue living from day to day, but we must not do anything to damage what is there, the bounty of the ocean, as you call it. <laughs> so, our aim now in, in, in Kiribati is to try and, and get everybody on board through the PIPA, and I'm glad that uh, Randy is talking about the PIPA now. The PIPA is, um, is now a tool, and I'm using it, I'm chair of that. I'm getting more and more excited. That the more I think about it, we need to get out into the community to the people there, 
the people there are still enjoying as much as they want about this. And they've changed their attitude, not like the old people, many generations back, they say, just collect enough. You don't need to, because they go bad and you, you, and you will contaminate the environment. You know, things will, will be foul smell. You know, you, you won't have enough time to uh, preserve this fish or whatever. So you just collect enough. And if you collect more than what you need, you throw it to the neighbors because that's the way the neighbors can use it. And the, when your neighbor is fishing and collecting too much, he will throw it back to you. That, that's the way we did things, but not now. And so we need to kind of maybe step back a bit, continue development, continue, but do it in a sensible way. Do it in a way we're not destroying ourselves and making ourselves go extinct as a human uh, population on, on the planet. And so we are working, PIPA is working on what they call bring people home together with the government. Bring people home means getting the mindset out there that people will have to start making rules like they used to do you know, way back. They say, you know, don't, don't, don't. Nowadays, we believe that the government is the one to make rules. And when the government makes real rules, we break them because they're not our rules. When the government decides to close that area, we will go and, and open it and continue fishing. Now, it's important that the communities are involved because once the communities are sitting down in the village and thinking about it, it becomes their own. And they say, this is our rule. We want to do it this because it's good for us and our children and our grandchildren. Let's preserve. Let's not catch fish when they're breeding. Let's you know, create a period, a moratorium of a week. Let the fish uh, breed. Uh, spawn and, and, and grow a bit and then you go out and catch. Uh, these are rules that are start coming in now as a result of Bring People Home an initiative. And I hope we will do have more of that, not only the Kiribati people, our neighbors in the Pacific, everybody around the world, coastal people, we must start thinking along this line. So if, if that uh, helps with that question, thank you. Oh, that's very interesting. Um, can I follow up on that with a question, which is that on Saturday, the advanced placement geography teachers will be working on doing a mapping exercise of Kiribati. What kinds of maps will be beneficial for them to create for the communities that you described, for the policymakers, for the government? Um, let us know what, what can be done with better data for Kiribati. Well, if I, if, well, Randy can also help with that. But I, if I can uh, uh, share my, my views on that uh, sort of question, yes, I think first of all we need to uh, get a, a a feel of the people that they've got this, you know enormous resource you know under their care and control of course thanks to the united nation declaring the, the 200 mile uh, easy economic exclusive exclusive economic zone thing because that has turned us into a huge continent right we're a continent we're a, a, an ocean continent little islands <laughs> only the size of new york as you put it uh, them but the ocean is as, as broad, as big as the Australia and the, and the American continent, sort of spread wise. And so they need to realize that that is a resource that they've got to help in protecting, not expecting the United Nations to come down. They've got to do their part. And of course, could have the global community coming in with frameworks and what have you. Uh, but the important thing is that people must get that chance. So the geography, 2050 will help the people who give it, drawing that map and maybe quantify to each person saying, and I think I tried to quantify it in my article on the people's story that it, it, for an, an ocean of that size, three and a half million square kilometer, and, and the average depth, which I, uh, you know, you know, which I, uh, you know, estimated in my paper was a thousand a thousand a thousand meters or a one kilometer but in fact if you increase it with a thousand with a thousand meters each person has about 40 cubic 
kilometers of ocean. I'm 40, each person in campus, 40 cubic kilometers. So it's 40 kilometers times one kilometer wide and deep is one kilometer deep. But if you raise the figure, the depth to two, even two, then it's 80 kilometers, cubic kilometer per person. And it's the wealth in that volume of, and if you raise, you know, raise the average to three, you know, you, uh, yes, Randy was saying 6,000 is the, 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 the deepest part of those islands, uh, the ocean is there. So, but you can imagine, so each keepers must realize there's the wealth to be protected, not only for themselves, but for the world, because we're going to feed the world, right? And of course, hopefully we'll make some money, but not too much money to destroy ourselves, you know, just make enough and manage it. So that sort of geography must be there in the mind of people. And then it makes them feel important that they are in, in, in charge of a, a, a huge stock of, a, of a biodiversity, marine biodiversity for the world, make them feel good. And so and then provide the tools, let them see what's inside. And I think Randy is always doing that coming in with these things, coming and letting people see on the screen. That's what you have. Look at these things. Many of the things they don't name, they don't have no names, but they never knew it. Their ancestors never go down that far to, to know that there was so much art down there. So that would be my uh, contribution to this question, Adam. Randy, Thank if you want to. Randy. I agree 100% with everything the ambassador has said. To me, every time I look at where I live, just at using these satellite images and, and Google Street View, right? I, it, it does two things for me. One, you know, it, it's practical. You're like, oh, okay, well, now I can connect the dots between this spot and this spot. But it also makes me feel a little vulnerable, right? About exactly how how little space there is around me and how little and how much we have to protect and how special and how um how there's no other space exactly like the one where I live, right? Or where you live. And every single space has its own really unique geography. And when you're on the ground, you can't get that sense of it. And so I think that any of these views, any of these maps that speakers will put together to help put that in context, to give the bird's eye view, to both help everybody connect the dots from one spot to another, and also just realize how special your spot is, is a re of real value. And the second thing is, I completely agree with the ambassador, is that the concept of depth is very hard. I'm a marine biologist, and it still blows my mind away when I think about how deep we're going, right, and how deep we can see and how and, and, and how much we don't know. It's really hard to wrap your head around. And I, you know, I've worked in Tarawa, and one of my favorite moments is working with um, a local village in North Tarawa, and we were trying to use some not not these big ROVs that we were showing you, but some of the smaller technology. And I said, you know, let's let's go to the deep sea. Take me to a deep spot. And they took me to a place that was about a hundred feet deep because that's where they usually fish for deep fish, and that is deep, but it's not a thousand meters, right, <laughs> or um, or two thousand or six thousand meters. And so, trying to expand our our understanding of what deep really means um, and what how much water that really is. You know, I love, love, love your way you're thinking about this, Ambassador Sito. You know, this really is a, every person in Kiribati is so wealthy in terms of ocean area and ocean volume. And trying to really drive that home is a really um, a big task. It's a huge challenge, but it's a really important one. Thank you, Dr. Rojan. Um, you obviously have a really cool job. And for the thousands of teachers and students who are online today, how would you suggest they go about getting a cool job like yours or even joining the Women Working for the Oceans? Well, you can join Women Working for the Oceans by going to the W2O website. Um, and there are some incredible ocean conservationists, um, ocean leaders, voices for the ocean, spokespeople for the ocean. Um, who help and contribute in all kinds of different ways. And so that's a really tangible organization that you can reach out to. Um, and it's it, it's growing and it's 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 a great group of people. So I really encourage you to check that out. As for my job, um, you know, every time I sit in a room, even this one, right, you know, everybody's in the same room at the same space and there's no exact similar path that everybody took to get to that room, right? There's no one way to get there. And so 
I um, have had many twists and turns in my career, and I would say that the one single ingredient that's been constant has been um, investment into where I am when I'm there. And so every time I'm in a place, I'm all the way there. I just jump right in with my whole heart and my whole that I have. I put all, you know, put it all in. And um, as things twist and turn, you you just go deeper without even realizing it, right? You just are part of where you are, and it your job kind of tailors to you, um, and you tailor to it. And it's a really sorry, that's not very practical, but I do think that I guess the practical piece of that is to invest in where you are. Um, really, if you have a passion, go for it. Go all the way. Don't don't stand at the edge and think, well, maybe I'll do this in a little while. No, you're there. Do it. You know, jump in the pool. Go all the way in. And um, and it'll take you to interesting places. And you just have to be open to the opportunities. I would like to add, if I may, that, you know, with your, you know, membership of thousands of uh, teachers and students of geography and uh, having said what I, I said earlier about the importance of this information knowledge knowledge you know and of course people in Kiribati are going to benefit and are they going to change their mindset are going to you know transform the, themselves and, and and do more in the, instead of waiting for the world to come and do things for them so it, it provides a connection i think what your membership the geography uh, geographic uh, american geographic society membership i believe can be very powerful force with your american you know membership here and, and your connection with the rest of the world with the bigger countries the powerful nations there's got to be this conversation that we need to all work together and help those island people protect what they have because it's not only theirs it belongs to all of us what the food and the fish and the shelf in the in the new york and uh, paris whatever it may be and the, anything from the sea must have some relationship with what we are doing in the Pacific, and especially in Kiribati, where we have a huge area there, and we are doing it all for, for all, not, not just for Kiribati people. I know we're doing that right now, and especially, and as I mentioned, there, the tuna spawning in, in that part of the Pacific. I think we are producing tuna. We are a factory, a, a biological factory, uh, producing you know, immeasurable amount of, not only tuna, the other fish that are on the tables every day to fill up the stomachs, you know, and, and, uh, and to, you know, to uh, uh, combat the hunger and the poverty, which is one of the, the biggest goals of the United Nations. Been working on it for 75 years, still have not achieved it. And so let's get all our membership in the Geographic Society uh, to support us and to all talk to the people going out fishing, the American who fish there, the Japanese who fish there, they've got to do it responsibly. They've got to be responsible people. They must not go and rip the resource and destroy it just because of what? Profit. They're aiming for bigger figures in the next financial account. And that, that is not the right thing. And so we need to engage and keep talking that we have a role to play, protect, help these people in the small islands. Not, 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 not enough uh, capacity yet, but they want to do something. And with our friends from outside coming in, I'm sure we'll be strong together, and we can save our ocean and our planet together. Thank you. And if any of the people listening today wish to either reach out to you or visit Kiribati. Is there a particular way they should be in contact with you, Dr. Rojan, or you, Mr. Ambassador? There is a website for the Phoenix Islands, which everyone is welcome to visit. And then of course, um, I'm at Boston University. My lab has a webpage. You can find me. I'm sometimes slow on email, but you can find me. Um, and I, I'll, let, I'll let the ambassador uh, jump in with his contact, but I'd love to add one more thing to what he had said earlier too. But ambassador, how should people reach you? Yes, well, I, I, I think I'm already providing my contact with <laughs> you, Adam. You can share that. You can share that. I, I tell you, you know, you can share that. I, I, in politics, I always say, share my contact to as many as possible. I'm out of politics now, but it's a different kind of politics. I'm mobilizing an idea. The idea is to reach out and, uh, and and keep connecting 
with as many as we so i'm available and i'm reachable and uh and of course and if they really want to get there without me they can go to honolulu catch a flight to honolulu and then look for a flight to christmas side it's about just two and a half hours our honolulu christmas uh, is very and another way is to go all the way uh, united airlines you know go all the way to marshall and the marshall islands is there just a, a one hour from the Majuro marshall to tarawa in kiribati it's just one hour and a smaller plane of course so that's easy, e e very easy to reach. And if they want to join me in my inaugural, the inaugural flight of our airline coming up here soon, then let them register with me so I can put them on the plane. Those are very, very <laughs> cool. And we can go together on the inaugural flight, which will travel from Tarawa, Canton, Christmas, Honolulu, and back that way. And so we can have a good time and enjoy ourselves seeing the islands of Kiribati and uh, bringing it back as a great message for people to help and join in the fight against all these terrible things happening around us. Mr. Ambassador, I, I want to just echo one thing that you said that I think is really important and that I hope that all of the teachers and students um, who are might be watching this really hear that the work that you and your country have done is amazing. What you have done to help protect the oceans is was catalytic around the world and was completely visionary and is something that I deeply respect. And it's an honor to be a part of this project. And for me, the mon but the science is amazing. The place is beautiful. The conservation is completely passion filled but the most important thing are the friendships and the relationships and the fact that we've done this together and collaboratively and have done things um, side by side and made new friends and in the spirit of international partnership i think has been just really special and i just wanted to let everybody know that whatever you do with kiribis do it with kiribis not just for kiribis not just um you know as a, as somebody who's so far away, yeah, there's always a way to reach out and do things with our partners and with our friends across the sea. And for me, it's that with, that one word, the word with, which has been a very defining characteristic of um, these relationships and of this project. And I'm very inspired by it, very inspired by the country. And I'm really grateful to this entire new world of geographers who can come and play a role. It's pretty exciting. That's great, Randy. You're kind of putting in a new definition of democracy there, with you know, you say, for the people, by the people, you know. But now you say with. <laughs> I'll make sure to tell our founding fathers. <laughs> I like that. And uh, if I may say, also add, uh, Randy, you are actually uh, uh, a good example of uh, a very, very good example of the the friendship between the people of Kiribati and the people of the United States. You're already a, a good embodiment of the Treaty of Friendship. Which, <laughs> which was we signed. are a good embodiment of the Treaty of Friendship. Yeah, Ambassador, well, yeah. I can't wait to see you in person again. All right. <laughs> of course, a Treaty of Friendship, which is very important and is still it there, is. still alive. We haven't changed it. We might have amend it to bring in Fanning and Washington now because they're not in that Treaty of Friendship. And who knows in the future? And of course, the good connection, good marine cooperation now is starting, but there should be more cooperation under that treaty of friendship between the United States and Kiribati. I don't know whether the United States signed treaty of friendship elsewhere, but maybe this is one very important friendship treaty. I and agree. we need to build on that. And I think you know, we should have more of our friends. The Americans come down, come down to Kiribati. You were there in the war, the Battle of Tarawa, and you, you know, we thank you for that. And you, you, you know, you created a, a peace and freedom on the island you know, from that terrible war that was uh, played in, <laughs> in our, on our island. Anyway, and so we must build on that and, and do more in terms of working together. Uh, Americans and Kiribati people working together. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Given that we've just had an election, what message would you like to send to our next president here in America? Um, and I'm sure you'd like to invite him down to Kiribati as well. 
Thank you, Adam. Now, that's a very coarse question. Of course, we are now waiting. Who's going to be the president? But whoever is the president, and now giving me this opportunity, I know you will deliver my message. I know the Geo American Geographic Society is so big, the president would not fail to listen to what the, your society be uh, delivering, especially on the inauguration or whatever. So I would wish, on behalf of Kiribati, wish the, the new president of the United States all the very best in our language, eight, the Maori, the Roy, and Tapumua, which means three things, the great gifts of the God, of our God, and the, the ancestral God. The Maori means, you know, life, uh, blooming life, life, real life, full of life. And, 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 and Tapu, Roy is peace, tranquility. And, uh, and Tapumua means, uh, you know, always uh, uh, always moving forward and achieving and, and prosperity, achieving whatever is needed to be achieved for the good of all. Yeah. So these are the blessings uh, that I bestow on behalf of Kiribati on your new president. And also to ask your new president if he could have time to uh, do more, to create more of that friendship, to build on that friendship was assigned uh, in September 1979, and to create more, 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 more cooperation, more friendship between the people of America and the people of Kiribati, and to, to develop a lot of cooperative uh, programs to protect our planet, protect the ocean, pr protect the the uh, the what we the beautiful things we have in the islands nowadays, and so we hope our the new president will be thinking more of that than and and giving more time for a small neighbor country like Kiribati, and and hope that the two countries can work together to make the world a better place for. All. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rojan. Mr. Ambassador, that was a fascinating session. I really loved it. Um, I'm sure that all of the thousands of teachers, students, and business people who are listening today will find this very interesting, and I'm sure that you will be getting lots of follow-up. Thank you very much on behalf of the American Geographical Society. Thank you. Thank you.